Everyone has questions. Why am I here? Where will I go when I die? Is there really truth? But not everyone has biblical answers. Welcome to The Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study the Bible to draw closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here is Pastor Tom Brock. Welcome to the Pastor Study. When I was seven years old, my family moved into a new house, and my parents had gone to some antique place and bought this big bell. And they put it on top of the roof, had this little shelter on top of it, had a long rope so you could ring the bell down by the garage. When my brother and I would be off lost in the neighborhood playing, Mom would ring the bell, and we knew to ran, run home. And we did this right, you know, in fact, we had a dog called Susie, and Susie would see us r running every time the bell would ring. When Susie got lost, we'd ring the bell, and Susie would run home. <laughs> and uh, today we're going to read and, and look at one of the saddest stories in the Old Testament. David was a good king. He loved the Lord, but for a period of his life, he got lost and he committed adultery and murder until God rang the bell, sent Nathan the prophet to David, and the good news is finally David came home, but oh, what a sad story it was before he came home. So what I'd like to do, I wanna just tell you the story of King David and then share with you eight lessons I get from David's downfall. Let's pray first. Father, we want to pray for anyone watching this program who is lost and who needs to hear the bell and run home to you, Lord. Lord, anyone who's committed adultery, murder, whatever sins may have been committed and they're shy and they're nervous about coming home, Lord, would you ring the bell and speak to us now and bring each of us back to Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Here's the story. The year is about 1000 B.C., David is king over Israel. He's a good king. Only person in the Bible of whom it says he, had a, he was a man after God's own heart. David wrote many of the Psalms. So David had a big, deep relationship with God. And then this happened. Well, it's springtime when kings go off to war, but for some reason, instead of going off to war, he sent his troops off, and David stayed in Jerusalem in the palace. He had a lot of free time. He's walking on the palace roof, and he looks across, and here is his next-door neighbor lady, very beautiful Bathsheba, naked, taking a bath. He says to his servant, who is that? Well, that is Uriah's wife, one of your soldier's wives. David says, bring her. She comes into the palace, they have sexual relations. Sometime later, David gets a knock on the door from Bathsheba's messenger. She's pregnant. David calls Uriah, her husband, home from the field. How's the war going, Uriah? Oh, fine, king. Well, go home and spend some time with your wife. Well, that night, Uriah stayed in the palace. And the king, the next day, Uriah, why didn't you go home to your wife? My king's army is in the battle, and, you, I, and for me to go home and eat and drink with my wife and lie with my wife, I will not do such a thing. So David says, we'll stay another day or two. David gets him drunk, hoping he'll go home to the wife. He doesn't. So finally, David writes a letter, probably seals it, puts it into Uriah's hands and says, go give this to Joab, the commander. Uriah goes back to the field. Uriah looks at, uh, Joab looks at the letter, put Uriah in the front line of the fighting and withdraw so that he's killed. Joab follows the instruction, Joab is killed. Well, David takes Bathsheba into the palace. She becomes his wife. She's pregnant now with his child. And David gets another knock on the door from the prophet Nathan. And Nathan says, David, I've got to tell you a story. There was a wealthy man who had lots of lambs, but a man comes out of town and 
the wealthy man wants to give him a, a lamb dinner, instead of taking one of his own lambs, there's a poor man who owns one lamb. And this lamb is like a little baby to him. He loves his lamb. Well, the rich man steals the one lamb, kills it, and, and gives it to dinner. And David gets angry and said, who has done such a thing? This man deserves to die. And Nathan puts his finger in David's face and says, you are the man. I, the Lord, gave you your uh, Saul's wives. Also, I gave you the kingdom. I gave you so much. Uriah had one little lamb, and you take it, and you commit adultery, and you kill him. And David hears this, and he says, I have sinned. And Nathan says, God has also put away your sin. You will not die. But because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child that is born to you in Bathsheba will die. And it says the Lord struck the child. And David for seven days fasts while the baby is dying. And after seven days, he hears his servants whispering. And, you know, now that the baby's dead, David will kill himself. And David hears this and he says, is the baby dead? And yes, he's dead. And it says David got up, washed himself, went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. That is the sad story of David and Bathsheba. Let me share with you some of the lessons I get from this story. Number one, it could happen to you. That David is the only man of whom it said he was a man after God's own heart and it happened to him. You know, no matter how strong a Christian you think you are, remember what Paul wrote to the Christians in 1 Corinthians 10, let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. I mean, I can think of a pastor here in the Twin Cities. He led his church in a big building program. They just got done building this huge new church, and the elders of his church have to meet him as he's coming off of the airplane to ask for his resignation because this pastor has been, ha been having an affair. Don't think it couldn't happen to you. I, mean, I went to a pastor's conference, and they said every pastor needs two things. Number one, a real prayer life, and number two, an accountability partner, somebody to regularly hold them accountable. How you doing? Are you avoiding your sins, etc., etc.? You need that too. Every Christian needs a real prayer life and an accountability partner. Do you have someone like that? Do you have a Nathan in your life like David had? Second lesson I get from David's downfall. Beware of too much free time. David should have been out in the field with his soldiers. Instead, he's got lots of free time in Jerusalem. <laughs> Remember the movie, The Music Man? The idle brain is the devil's playground trouble right here in River City. And if your brain is idle, you've got lots of free time. That's when the devil steps in. I mean, the Bible basically says that. It's in Ephesians 5.16. Paul says, make the most of your time for the days are evil. In other words, we live in an evil world, and if you just have lots of free time, it'll, it'll aim toward evil unless you fight to make the most of your time. There's a story of a little boy that goes to the castle. Can I see the king? And the king, a very benevolent ruler grants him an audience. The little boy comes into the throne room. King, my parents say you're the best king we've ever known. What is the secret to your godliness? And the king says, little boy, I will tell you the secret. But then he put a gold cup in the little boy's hand, filled it with wine, and said, now little boy, I will tell you the secret, but first you have to take this cup of wine walk out of the palace, go all the way to the center of town, turn around and come back and put it into my hands. If you don't spill one drop, I'll tell you the secret. But the whole time you're walking, my servant will follow you with the sword. And if you spill one drop, he will cut off your head. The little boy took the cup, walked out of the palace all the way to town, came back, put it gingerly back in the king's hands, hadn't spilled a drop. And the king said, little boy, what did you see when you were just in town? 
Oh, King, I didn't see anything. I was looking at that cup. You mean you didn't see the women in the street or the dancers and the, or the women, uh, men in the shop? You didn't see the farmers? The, no, no, King, I was looking at that cup. And he said, little boy, that is the secret to the godly life. If you are fixed on serving the Lord and doing his will, you won't have time to look around to see what the devil is trying to get you to do. That's what... That's where David got into trouble. He had all this free time, and instead of fixing his eyes on the Lord, he started looking around a lot. Third lesson I get from David. Our sin causes unbelievers to mock God. Nathan said, David, because by this deed you have given occasion to God's enemies to mock him, your baby's going to die. Do you know that when, when someone sees you as a Christian sinning, it gives them an opportunity to say, I don't need their God. Back in the 1980s, we had the Jim Baker scandal and the Jimmy Swigert scandal. In more recent years, we've had the Catholic priests abusing children scandals. And when all that kind of thing happens, it gives occasion to the enemies of the Lord to say, see, their God is nothing. Next lesson I get from David, confess, don't cover. Cover-ups don't work. First, he tried to get Uriah to sleep with his wife. That didn't work. Then he got Uriah drunk to go home and sleep with his wife. That didn't work. Then David tried to cover up his sin by uh, killing Uriah. That didn't work. And truth is, cover-ups don't work. The Bible says, know that your sin will find you out. <laughs> now, what, what should David have done when Bathsheba got pregnant? This would have been horribly difficult, but here's what I think he should have done. Call Uriah back from the field. Uriah, I have sinned against God and against you. I committed adultery with your wife. I submit to you in the courts. Do thy will. Horribly hard as that would have been to do, it maybe would have saved the life of the baby and then later three others of David's sons because... The prophet Nathan said, David, because of this deed, the baby will die, and you'll have the sword in your household from now on. And later, three more of David's sons died as a result of his sin. Cover-ups don't work. Years ago when I was in college, I led a Bible study, and there was a very spiritual uh, young woman in my Bible study. And in fact, I remember one day saying, what'd you do today? Oh, today I just spent the whole day with the Lord. <laughs> I said to her, what do you mean you spent the whole day with the Lord? Oh, I spent the whole day praying and reading my Bible and worshiping and singing to the Lord. So it's just a real spiritual gal. Well, I've known her through the years. She gets married and they move to another state. And I go out to visit her. And she and her husband and I are, are, are talking uh, one night. But then he goes to bed and... So she and I stay up late talking, and she tells me, I've been having an affair. And we talked. And I said to her, have you told your husband? Oh, no, no, I'm not telling him. I said, well, you know, don't you think that would probably be what you need? No, 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 no. Well, maybe six months later, I got a phone call. You know, Tom, remember when you said for me to do that and I wouldn't? Well, a few months ago, I, we pull up in the driveway, and it's like something came upon me. And I started crying, and I confessed my sin to my husband. And then he started crying, and he confessed his sin. His mistress was his job. And, and he asked me to forgive him. We had mutual forgiveness. She said, God has healed our marriage. They have children now. They have a marriage now. <laughs> but... Cover-ups don't work. And, and listen to what it says in Proverbs 23. He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. If there's something you're hiding, he who hides his transgression, you won't prosper, but if you confess them and forsake them, you'll find mercy. Here's the next lesson I learned from David. Heed God's prophets. David listened to Nathan. You know what, what other Old Testament did, uh, uh, kings did to the prophets? They killed them. <laughs> but David didn't kill Nathan when he got in his face. He said, I have sinned, and he listened to him. Do you listen to the people that God has put in your life? 
Everybody needs a, Dave, a, a, a Nathan. Let me quote from one of my favorite books, C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. Now, please listen to this for two minutes. I find a good many people have been bothered by what I said in the last chapter of our Lord's words, be ye perfect. I think he meant, the only help I will give you is help to make you perfect. You may want something less, but I will give you nothing less. Let me explain. When I was a child, I often had a toothache, and I knew that if I went to my mother, she would give me something which would deaden the pain for that night and let me sleep. But I did not go to my mother, at least not till the pain became very bad. And the reason I did not go was this. I did not doubt she would give me the aspirin, but I knew she would also do something else. I knew she would take me to the dentist the next morning, and I would not get what I wanted out of her without getting something more, which I did not want. I wanted immediate relief from pain, but I could not get it without having my teeth set permanently right. And I knew those dentists. I knew they started fiddling about with all sorts of other teeth with which there had not begun an ache. They would not let sleeping dogs lie. If I gave them an inch, they would take a mile. Now, if I may put it this way, our Lord is like the dentist. If you give him an inch, he will take a mile. Dozens of people go to him to be cured of some particular sin which they are ashamed of, like masturbation or physical cowardice, or which is obviously spoiling their daily life, like a bad temper or drunkenness. Well, he will cure it all right, but he will not stop there. That may be all you asked for, but if once you call him in, he will give you the full treatment. That is why, people, why Jesus warned people to count the cost before becoming Christians. Make no mistake, he says, if you let me, I will make you perfect. The moment you put yourself in my hands, that is what you were in for, nothing less or other than that. You have free will, and if you choose, you can push me away. But if you do not push me away, understand that I am going to see this job through. Whatever suffering it may cost you in your earthly life, whatever inconceivable purification it may cost you after death, he believed in purgatory, I don't, but he did. Uh, whatever it costs me, I will never rest, says the Lord, nor let you rest until you are literally perfect, until my Father can say without reservation that he is pleased with you, as he ha has said about being pleased with me. This I can do and will do, but I will not do anything less. <laughs> in other words, every Christian needs a Nathan in your life to help you become perfect. Here's the next lesson. God forgives. This is the big lesson of, of David and Bathsheba. God forgives. And I, I preached, I'm a Lutheran, but I preached this at a Baptist church recently, and I said, David committed murder and adultery. Why did God forgive him? And well, one said, because he was sorry. Or another said, because he, he uh, repented. And I said, yeah, but what's the reason God forgives anybody? And then finally, one person said, Jesus died for his sins. And I said, that's it. Now, you might say, yeah, but David lived 1000 BC. Uh, Jesus hadn't died yet. In fact, I get the question, you know, will we see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in heaven? Because they lived before Jesus died. And Jesus said, you will see Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. So here's my point. The cross is retroactive. The reason God forgave David his sins is because God knew there'll be a descendant of David called the son of David, the Messiah, who will come and pay for David's sins. So you'll see all the Old Testament saints that trusted in God in the Old Testament because the cross is retroactive. Next lesson. Forgiven sin can still wreck your family. David said, and excuse me, Nathan said, David, your sin is forgiven, but because of this, your child will die. I mean, I can think of these parents who are on drugs. My, how their children are paying because of their parents' drug addiction. And you might, not, and you might say, well, that's not fair. Why should children suffer because of the parents' sins? And that's the point here. Sin isn't fair. So parents, stay away from sin or you'll wreck your kids. I mean, when I was eight years old, I discovered my dad's pornography in the garage. That stuff messed me up. I talked to a dad last week. His seven-year-old daughter discovered pornography on the internet, and he said, I looked at the, at the history of what you, she watched it for hours. And he said, it's not because I, I think she's just curious is what he said, but parents, your sins can really damage your children.
Last lesson. In spite of this horror story, there is a good ending. Here's the last lesson. David came home. It says this, When David heard that the child was dead, he rose from the ground, washed himself, went into the house of the Lord, and worshipped. It could have said, when David heard the child was dead, he said, I'll never serve God again. How could God kill my baby? Anyway, blown it so bad, God would never use me anyway. It doesn't say that. It says, when David heard the child was dead, he goes into the house of the Lord and worships. You know what made David a man of God? Not that he never sinned, because he did. But when he sinned, he was sorry, he repented, and he turned back to God. You know, the, the, the woman I told you about that I knew from college who had the affair, you know what she said to me? I'm so glad David is in the Bible. I committed adultery, but David committed adultery and murder. And if there's hope for David, there's hope for me. So l let me just close with this. Maybe you right now are lost. You're committing adultery or you're living with your girlfriend or you're, uh, maybe you're just as lost as you can be. I want you to remember that bell that was on the roof of my house. God is ringing the bell for you. The fact that you're even hearing this, God wants you to come to Christ and turn for your sins and do what David did. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, David didn't understand this. It was a thousand years earlier. But David did understand that if I come back to God, in spite of whatever else may have to happen, he will indeed forgive me and I'll be his child again. I love that. Read Psalm 51 on your own tonight. That's the Psalm David wrote after he got convicted by Nathan, and it's the most, one of the most beautiful parts of the Bible. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Amen. Welcome to the portion of the pastor study where we now ask Pastor Brock to share with us his knowledge of Scripture and his insights to answer questions we have regarding the Bible, our Lord, and our everyday walk with him. Pastor Brock, in light of what you've just talked about, does God forgive a person if they keep doing the same sin over and over? I mean... Yeah, and I think the, I think the answer is that depends. It depends on their heart. Uh, Jackie, if you're living in impenitent sin, I don't think he does forgive you. But if you're stumbling and you're getting up and you're stumbling and you're sorry and you always come to Christ, I think there's forgiveness. And I get this from this. Peter says, Jesus, do I have to forgive my brother seven times a day? And Jesus says, no. 70 times 7 per day. And if I have to do that for you, don't you think the Lord's doing at least that much for me? So, and, and 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. So I think if you're sorry and you're turning to Christ, there's always forgiveness. But you're li if you're living in it and there's no repentance, then I don't think he forgives your sins. Okay. Pastor Brock, you, you talked about Nathan being a prophet to David and that God sent him to David. Mm -hmm. Does God send prophets to people today mm -hmm. in our culture? Mm -hmm. We need some prophets in our culture. Are there any? Oh, well, I think, Bi I, I think Billy Graham. I think Dr. James Dobson has kind of been a prophet to our culture. But I can't think of many. We need some, some Christian people to stand up and say no to sin in our culture. I'll tell you another one, though. Uh, Jane Corvey the original Roe versus Wade woman who, who wanted the abortion and she uh, took her to the Supreme Court, she had a 180 degree turn. She's a Christian now and she preaches against abortion. So she's one. Problem is, the liberal media doesn't want to interview her. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the, there may be prophets and there are prophets in our culture, but because the devil runs most of the media, you're not going to hear their voice very often. So how do you distinguish a false prophet from a real prophet? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, to know you're hearing good, good, something. Good question. When you've got, I'm a Lutheran, you're a Lutheran. When you've got Lutheran bishops proclaiming that abortion rights are good, that gay marriage is good, well, he's a man of the cloth, he's a bishop. Well, the way you test who's a true bishop and who's a false bishop, the Word of God. Does the Bible say it's okay to kill babies? Does the Bible say two men having sex is a marriage? No, you've got to test. We live in a weird day, Jackie, where people in the church are false prophets, leading churches. So you've got to, you've got to read the Bible. Every Christian needs to read their Bible regularly. Okay. Pastor Brock, David's sin hurt his family. And, you know, I guess when we look at what's happening in the world today, what should we as parents do if we know we've hurt our children? Mm -hmm. yeah, you I, talked about yeah. the couple that was using drugs. drugs yeah. 
And you know what is so powerful? And it doesn't happen often. But I heard a great message this week on honoring your parents. And just a, it, people got tears in their eyes. And you know how powerful it is when a dad or a mom says to their child, you know, I was wrong when I said that to you. Will you please forgive me? Or, to, or you know, 40 years later, as, as you as a parent think back, when you said something to your daughter or your son that really you never should have said, boy, it, it's just healthy for you to say, do you remember when I did this? And they, maybe they won't even remember, but I'm so sorry. Would you forgive me? I mean, asking for forgiveness is something we need to do more of. Yeah. I think that's a hard thing. A parent doesn't like to admit that they're wrong, mm -hmm. though. So, I mean, I think that's a really good lesson for mm -hmm. all of us, mm -hmm. you know, that there's always a chance to ask for forgiveness, that's even right. if you just something pops in your mind. Yeah. And it probably would strengthen your relationship and with you, that And I child. don't know if you know this song, Jackie, but there's a song called In the Living Years about I wish my father was alive and I would have told him some of these things in the living years because Dad's dead. Mm -hmm. And so while, while you're able to, go ahead. <laughs> okay, we only have about 50 seconds yeah. left, and I, at the end of the program, it's always nice to let people know sure. what's happening. Yeah. So do you want to take it from yeah, here? Yeah, everybody. Uh, we want to ask you to pray for this ministry. Uh, we are kind of always on a shoestring here. We're on locally in the Twin Cities, and then we're on nationally on DirecTV and Dish Network. But it's a lot of money to be on nationally. So we want to ask you just to pray for our ministry. We've got enough funds to be on for a few more months nationally. But if the Lord nudges you to help, just go to pastorstudy.org or look at the uh, address at the end of the, of the program and just pray about it. And if the Lord nudges you, hallelujah, but pray for us. And if somebody wants to have a copy of this program, they can go to pastorstudy.org mm -hmm. and see all of the programs for that free. we've recorded for free, yeah. right? Or pass them on to someone who needs to hear this message. Yeah. We pray that God would be with you this week, granting you his richest blessings until we're together again next time. Thank you for watching The Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the gospel of Christ because of our generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org. Or write The Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and always.